the potato hack was coined when this guy, Chris Voigt, uh, ate nothing but potatoes, and he wound up losing 21 pounds in about two months, eating 2,200 calories of potatoes every day. I stole this chart from Denise Minger's In Defense of Low Fat. She's pointing out that these very low fat diets have some type of magic when it comes to weight loss and metabolic health, and that these keto diets up here, which are more than 65% of calories are from fat, so these are keto diets, and these work by some other type of magic. And in the middle, and this is perhaps my favorite part of this graph, is what she calls the macronutrient swampland. Just to show an experiment that shows that the potato hack style diet can actually work, this is an ad lib diet. Uh, these are all men. The most significant result was that at the end of 12 months, the patients who had managed to maintain less than 20% of calories from fat, their average weights had gone from 186 pounds to 164 pounds. We want to test this, and there's one great recent experiment. Uh, led by Kevin Hall that does exactly that. And this is exactly the study that we want in the low carb diet. 10% of calories are from carbs, 75% of calories are from fat. And in the low fat diet, those things are exactly reversed. Okay, so if we jump right to the bottom line, who lost more fat mass? And the answer is the people eating ad lib on the potato hack low fat diet you can see energy intake over the 14 days you can see that on average people consume five or six hundred calories more on the ketogenic diet literally every individual consumed less calories on the high carb low fat diet than they did on the high fat ketogenic diet of course one of the rationales for low carb diets is they reduce insulin signaling people on the low fat diet they're eating tons and tons of carbohydrates and you can see immediately when they eat, you have this big spike in insulin that comes back down to baseline within about four hours. When you look at fasting insulin in the morning after the low carb diet or interestingly, the low fat diet, both groups of people had significant reductions in their fasting insulin levels. And they both reduced uh, fasting blood glucose by a pretty similar amount. What is very interesting in this table and is very important, and we're gonna focus on for the rest of the video, are the free fatty acids. So these are the fats that are released by your adipose tissues, by your fat tissues, and those are uh, fats that circulate around in your blood and they are available for your cells to take up and use at fuel at any moment. And you can see at baseline, that number was 328. Um, insulin suppresses the release of free fatty acids. And so on the low carb diet, you see more than doubling of free fatty acids. What was more surprising, I thought, is on the low fat diet, there's also a significant increase in free fatty acids, and that might be due to the lowered fasting insulin levels. Elevated branched chain amino acids are an indicator of insulin resistance. They're all lowered on the low fat, high carbohydrate diet. All of the branched chain amino acids are significantly increased on the low carb ketogenic diet. Conversely, uh, what is the magic that drives the potato hack? One of the major problems with obese humans is that we are actually not good at burning glucose. Immediately, the lean humans upon eating these bagels, they're burning the carbohydrate. Uh, that they consume, whereas the obese people, they lag. The area under the curve is significantly less uh, for the obese humans compared to the lean humans. So we can say that obese humans lack metabolic flexibility. They're bad at burning glucose. They are stuck burning more fat compared to their lean counterparts. And so why can't obese humans burn glucose? And for that, you have to look at the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle is, of course, how we burn all of our food, how we burn all of our fuels. If you look at the top of the Krebs cycle, glucose has to go through this enzyme called pyruvate dehydrogenase to become acetyl-CoA. A lot of enzymes are inhibited by the products that they create. And that makes sense because the enzyme, if the enzyme is producing a lot of acetyl-CoA, for instance, and the mitochondria is already full of acetyl-CoA, then there's really not any need to make more acetyl-CoA at the moment. Pyruvate dehydrogenase converts pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, and in the process, it converts NAD plus to NADH. And so both NADH 
and acetyl-CoA will block the activity of pyruvate dehydrogenase. Conversely, insulin is trying to activate pyruvate dehydrogenase through something called pyruvate dehydrogenase phosphatase. So when those obese humans eat that glucose, eat those bagels, insulin starts signaling and it starts trying to activate this pyruvate dehydrogenase and then whether or not that works is going to be determined by how insulin sensitive are they what are their circulating levels of branched chain amino acids what are the mitochondrial levels of nadh and acetyl coa those are the things that determine how quickly those obese humans can start to burn those incoming carbohydrates and this is super important so this is an old saying taught to medical students i like to quote it the saying was fat burns in the flame of carbohydrate and the reason that i like this uh, the reason that i talk about it is that carbohydrates and fat have very different effects on the nad plus levels of cells uh, we need nad plus to run our metabolism burning carbohydrates increases nad plus levels and burning fat reduces nad plus levels and so this burning of glucose and fat is controlled by something called the randall cycle what the randall cycle shows us is that these uh, free fatty acids in the bloodstream are brought into cells by uh, a protein called CD36. This LCFA means long chain fatty acids. So the fats come in through CD36 and they're transported into the mitochondria by an enzyme called CPT1. And when fat gets into the mitochondria, it gets broken down by a product process called beta oxidation into acetyl CoA. And acetyl CoA is just a little two carbon. It's like a little mini micro fat. That's what goes into the Krebs cycle. That's what we oxidize to make ATP. When acetyl-CoA levels get high, it blocks pyruvate. And pyruvate is how we burn glucose. What the Randall cycle says, if you're burning a lot of fat, it inhibits the burning of glucose. This is how the cell looks. Uh, here's the fat in the bloodstream. The CD36 takes it into the cell. And from there, CPT1 takes it into the mitochondria where it can enter the Krebs cycle. And so this paper shows the levels of circulating uh, free fatty acids in healthy controls is around 2000. These are patients with fatty liver disease. So in, in lean patients with fatty liver disease, uh, those free fatty acids go from 2000 up to 2400. Um, in overweight patients with NAFLD, it's about the same, but in obese patients with NAFLD, uh, that number goes all the way up to 2,700. This is in patients with chronic hepatitis C, and you can see uh, the more fat, uh, the more CD36 these people have, the higher their plasma insulin goes. Uh, the more insulin resistant they are, HOMA IR is a measure of insulin resistance, and the higher the BMI that they have. So that brings us back to the Kevin Hall study, the low carb versus the low fat diet study that uh, I that we've been talking about. You can see on the low carb diet, people have significantly higher baseline free fatty acids, right? And so they're not going to be able to efficiently burn glucose. That would be our prediction. What happened here is at time zero, they take an oral glucose tolerance test. And so they suck down a liquid glucose solution. And here's those two tables that I showed you just stacked upon each other at the same time frame. The lean people start to burn the glucose from the bagels within a half an hour and their nad plus levels already rise by an hour they have started to burn that glucose nad plus levels rise so here's what i'm arguing is the potato hack magic insulin lowers free fatty acids and insulin activates pyruvate dehydrogenase complex if you do those things you'll be able to burn glucose if you can burn glucose, you will increase the NAD plus to NADH ratio in your mitochondria. If you go back and watch my video, the redox case for carbs in under 10 minutes, you will learn the magic of how it is that pyruvate dehydrogenase increases NAD plus levels. 
And this again is the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle. And so every molecule of acetyl-CoA that comes in, and like I say, acetyl-CoA comes both from glucose and it comes from fat, it comes from ketones, it comes from alcohol. And to burn, to effectively burn the acetyl-CoA for energy, you need an NAD plus here, you need an NAD plus here, and you need an NAD plus here. So as those, uh, as those humans are burning those bagels, they're increasing NAD+. This causes the circle to go around faster. And if you look at dozens of studies done in the 80s and 90s um, and, and since then, you can see that consumption of carbohydrates increases your metabolic rate postprandially. Uh, and the reason for that, in my opinion, is that uh, by burning that glucose, you're creating more NAD plus, and that is allowing your metabolism to roll forward. And I think that this is the magic of the potato hack.